Well, welcome to another RetroNAS uh, how-to video. This one we're going to look at managing storage on your RetroNAS um, and we're going to do that via Cockpit which is a uh, web-based GUI management tool that will hopefully make your life a lot easier when it comes to uh, adding, removing, managing storage that's attached to your Raspberry Pi and your RetroNAS. Okay, as always we'll SSH into our Pi and run RetroNAS. And from our install manager, we'll choose cockpit. Okay, so that's got uh, Cockpit installed uh, and you can check that service by going to Check Services uh, Cockpit and you'll see that it's running uh, and now we can use it. So if you fire up a web browser, uh, point to the IP address of your Raspberry Pi on port 1990. Uh, and because this is uh, SSL encrypted, a couple of notes. Uh, note number one is that you will need a modern-ish browser to use this. Um, I might try and see if I can get uh, the Web1 proxy working around that somehow, although I think that the uh, the dynamic nature of this probably won't work so well. It doesn't work too bad from a, uh, from a mobile phone, so you can use it from your uh, Android or iOS device if you like. Uh, that's not too bad. Um, however, yeah, so uh, modern-ish browsers recommended, but you'll usually get this um, SSL uh, certificate error because it's just self-signed internally. Uh, if you just click your way through that, so I'm just using Chrome here, uh, telling it to proceed. Firefox has a slightly different um, uh, page for that, but it's a similar sort of process. Um, it'll ask you for the username and password to progress further. Now you'll need to use your root user. Um, you'll have to have set that up in the Raspberry Pi config. Um, normally we use the Pi user for everything with RetroNAS, but this uh, needs a lot of system access, so it needs to be uh, logged in as the root user. Um, I've just set my root user username, uh, well the username is root, but the password is Pi. Uh, again, probably worth using a stronger password than that, but I'm just going to use that for all of my setup just uh, as an example. And once you've logged in, uh, you'll be greeted with the cockpit default page. It tells you a few things about your system, which is kind of nice. Uh, it tells you CPU usage, memory usage, all those sorts of things. So you can see here I'm on a Raspberry Pi Model 4B. Uh, it's got four CPUs and eight gig of RAM. Uh, I use this for a lot of different things, for testing various software, for MAME compiles, for uh, retro gaming. I, I do a lot of DOS gaming on this. Uh, so it's a great little machine. Um, uh, if we click on our services, we can look through uh, services that start and stop now. Um, the RetroPi installer auto starts most things. So on reboot, all of these services will, uh, will launch by themselves. But you can browse through these and uh, see all the individual services. You can turn things on and off, enable and disable them. You can restart things if you like. Um, they're all listed there. So full uh, service management through Cockpit. The networking tab is another tab uh, where you can look at the different interfaces on your Raspberry Pi um, and see what they're configured to. Um, you can set up your wireless and wired. So my wired is set up. Uh, to automatically get this particular IP address from my DHCP server, but it's all automatic. Again, you can configure whatever you like through here. Uh, just note, obviously, if you change your IP address while you're connected to it via a uh, web interface, that uh, this IP address that you set here is going to change as you update it and probably uh, kick you off. So make sure it's an IP address that you can get to um, if you're going to change that IP address.
You can also click on this uh, software updates button here uh, and will tell you uh, when the last time you updated your system software. And of course you can uh, refresh that and check it. Now RetroNAS when it fires up, um, it checks to make sure that your uh, package cache is pretty up to date obviously because it does things like install packages from the internet so it makes sure that's all up to date. Um, however if you want to update your whole system, so not just software that RetroNAS installs but also um, all the system software, make sure you've got all the latest security updates and things, um, it's not a bad thing to do. You can do that from this menu. This machine has been recently updated so uh, nothing appears here so you won't see that there. Another useful tool is the uh, log section. Uh, so this will tell you uh, all of your logs uh, from your system log. Um, you can look at pretty much anything. Um, don't have to just look at error stuff, you can look at info stuff. Uh, and it goes looking at uh, not just uh, cockpit itself but system logs as well to tell you what's going on. You can see this thing booted recently. Oops this thing booted recently uh, and uh, started the date and time servers, set its host name, all those sorts of things, any errors that happen in the system, uh, anything goes wrong, they'll appear here, so it's not bad to look through those. Uh, of course we're here to manage our storage, that's the main reason we've got Cockpit installed, it's got a lot of useful things of course, um, however storage is the, the big one that we want to access. Um, now my particular uh, Raspberry Pi netboots. I've got a, a, in a network boot system so you won't see local SD storage. If you were on a, um, a regular Raspberry Pi with an SD card you'd see some slightly different storage here. Um, but I do have a uh, USB 3 to SATA adapter plugged in uh, and into that I've got a 160 gigabyte SSD. So you can see that here, it's this Intel SSD. Uh, and it's coming up as device uh, SDA, serial device A. Uh, it's currently got an NTFS file system on it. It used to have a, a Windows install or something on it. Uh, I've pulled it out of a machine and I want to use it here to be my uh, storage for my uh, RetroNAS. So I can set this up uh, to uh, be formatted and attached to my Raspberry Pi and be auto um, auto mounted and auto used by the RetroPi services every time this thing boots. So let's do that, let's uh, create a fresh partition table on this, we're going to wipe this NTFS file system, uh, we're going to uh, create a different file system now, up to you what you want to use here, you can use traditional MBR or GPT, so MBR is useful for uh, legacy systems that use BIOS. Um, if you ever want to take this drive out and plug it into something else, um, and it's an older system, so probably not a, a UEFI based system or like a Windows 10 based system, something a bit older, MBR is the way to go. Uh, if you've got a modern system, GPT is the way to go. Um, for a Raspberry Pi, it doesn't matter. Raspberry Pi can read either of these. We'll pick GPT because it's a bit more modern. Um, if you want to zero the drive you can, no real point doing this on an SSD, uh, but if you've got an old PLATA drive that you want to write, it's more a security thing, um, I'm not particularly fussed with this because I'm just going to overwrite the data on there. So I initialize that device and it's going to wipe it, there's now nothing on that SSD, the old Windows NTFS file system is gone. So let's create a partition on it. I usually leave the name blank, um, it's just a label that goes on the device, uh, you can call it whatever you like, it doesn't really matter, uh, what matters more is the mount point that we'll mount it on inside our Linux tree, that's the, the main bit. Now the file system is kind of important, um, there's a few options here, I've installed some extra options um, it, that the Ansible installer puts onto the system, uh, including things like BTRFS, um, there's some LVM and RAID and those sorts of things. I'm not going to go through that now, I'm going to keep this pretty simple today. Uh, I'm just going to make this an EXT4 partition now. Uh, the reason for that is EXT4 is the, uh, well XFS is, is also a Linux system, but EXT4 is a, a default Linux system, it's the, the file system that the Raspberry Pi boots off, um, so not its actual boot header which is fat, but the rest of the operating system is EXT4. Um, it's native to Linux um, and it understands uh, Linux uh, file system partition, uh, file system permissions and those sorts of things, um, which is quite important to us when we're hosting this off a 
uh, Linux based system like the Raspberry Pi. You can uh, format it to be VFAT, which is just uh, FAT32. Um, that will work too, and we'll do that in a later video when we look at EtherDFS. Very important that EtherDFS uses a FAT based file system, not an XT4 or Linux based file system. Uh, but it can cause some uh, other trickiness when it comes to how that's presented back to the system. So I'll treat that uh, separately in a separate video, and I'll go through the details for that. For today, we're going to keep it nice and simple. We're going to make that an EXT4 partition. You can make it any size you like. Uh, I'm just going to make it the maximum size here and then we need to pick a mount point so this is where uh, retro NAS will uh, host the information um, so I'm just going to call mine storage um, for no real reason other than and I'll spell it correctly for no real reason then uh, it's a convenient name I remember what it is um, you can call it anything you like um, RetroNAS will export that as uh, RetroNAS, no matter what you call it, but um, just uh, worth remembering what this is going to be later on when we change the mount point inside RetroNAS itself. Uh, so you've got a couple options here. Uh, you can mount it straight away. Um, you can choose to mount it read-only, which is not really advised unless you, you specifically want it to be read-only for whatever reason. Uh, you can choose never mount it boot, which uh, I don't know why you'd really choose that. We want this to come up every time our, our Raspberry Pi and Retro Pi start up. Um, and you can set some custom mount options. We won't go into the custom mount options today. They're more for if um, you're using VFAT and things like that, where you have to specifically tell it to be owned by a specific user because the on-disk permissions don't understand Linux systems. Um, but we don't have to worry about any of that today. So uh, the important bit is the mount point and the file system. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and do that. Okay, now that that's formatted and mounted, we can click on the little uh, thing here and it'll tell us uh, the file size, things like a UUID, we don't really need to know about that. Um, it's just a, a unique uh, fingerprint uh, randomly generated that gets put on the disk um, so that if you swap different disks, disks in and out that are different sizes, uh, the system doesn't get confused. Uh, but that's available now. We can actually see that. Um, if we switch over to our Retro Pry machine and run some sort of arcane... Um, uh, command line options we can see here there's our uh, storage that we've loaded um, and again cockpit's done all that for us in a GUI but we can see that in the command line which is really nice um, so we can go back into retro NAS now um, and we do have to tell retro NAS where that new storage is so by default retro NAS wants to use this data retro NAS directory it's just an arbitrary default that I've chosen for no real good reason um, but if you want to change that, we have to change that here. Uh, so we're going to configure our top level directory. Um, now I'm not really happy with this input menu. Um, I find if you sort of scroll up and scroll down in here, it's difficult to select things. If I press enter here, it wants to say what I've done. Um, so I, the much better option is just to type in here what you want. Um, again, it's not really great, but until I find a, a better menu system than this one, uh, it'll stick. So storage is what we called the mount point. That's what we'll make our top level directory in RetroNAS. We'll select that. Um, it says, are you absolutely sure? Do you want to change this? We'll say yes. All right, and that's reflected there. Now storage becomes our top level directory um, instead of that previous uh, system. Now, the downside to this is that we have to reinstall any existing services. Um, so I really recommend you get your storage all set up uh, early um, and then install services after that. Um, if you have installed services, you can just reinstall them. So for example, um, on this particular system, I've installed Samba already for a previous video. Uh, if I just go and reinstall that, what you'll probably find is that it's quite fast because it doesn't have to go and actually uh, reinstall things uh, and you'll probably notice too that there are fewer changes so changes come up as this orange yellow color uh, anything green is things that are unchanged a lot of these options are not changed however you'll notice the retro shares option is changed so uh, the Ansible system, which is the sort of the core of RetroNAS, has detected that there has been a change, i.e. the directory location has changed. Uh, and from there, uh, it will also detect that it has to go and restart some services. 
So that's done. Um, you have to repeat for any services that export storage. Uh, so things like uh, SSH and Telnet, you know, they don't export any storage, so you don't need to reinstall those. But if you've installed something like FTP, uh, EtherDFS, NetATalk, Samba, any of those sorts of things that actually export storage out, uh, you will need to reinstall those services in order for them to work off the new storage. Uh, if you've got any um, files that are on an existing piece of storage, you'll need to migrate those across as well. So again, much better to have this all set up and installed before you go and install services. Um, and of course, you can do this all via the command line. There's nothing stopping you doing that. So we can see what uh, RetroNAS has done on the uh, in the command line as well. Uh, if we look at what we call our file system table, or FS tab for short, uh, we can see that RetroNAS has gone and put that device uh, via its UID, its unique identifier that it created, uh, mounted as upper storage. So if I was to reboot this Raspberry Pi, um, that would come up every time in the same spot. And then all the services that relied on that, so Samba or NetATalk or uh, FTP or whatever it is that you've installed, uh, will all find the storage and they'll work off that again. So of course you can go and do all of this uh, manually if you like. You can edit FS tab and uh, format your own storage, mount your own storage, do all these things in the back line, background via command line. There's nothing stopping you doing that. Uh, if you don't want to do that and you'd rather this uh, graphical system, uh, you can absolutely do that. So there's our storage that we've created, uh, the type and the mount point, uh, and also some usage. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of information about the usage and some nice graphs up here too. If you want to see the uh, read and write speed uh, of different um, things that are going on, uh, compare that to your network speed as well and your networking um, so you can see the speed at which uh, other systems are accessing your RetroNAS and whether or not they're getting the full one gigabit which is, is uh, doable on a Raspberry Pi 4 um, not so doable on a Raspberry Pi 3 or older where the uh, Ethernet device is uh, USB attached or definitely a Raspberry Pi 2 where it's only 100 megabit. So Raspberry Pi 4 is a good piece of hardware to uh, run this whole system off. Anyway, so that's storage management in a nutshell. Um, I'll have some more videos later about some special cases, uh, particularly EtherDFS, which really requires FAT file systems. It can't work off uh, Linux style uh, ext4. And I might do an example later on where um, I mount up a uh, NTFS volume. So perhaps I want to use a piece of storage that's interchangeable uh, between my RetroNAS and my Windows PC. I just want to unplug it from one and plug it into the other to transfer some files across. I'll do an example on that too. Uh, but this is a pretty simple, straightforward option that should hopefully at least get you playing with some storage on RetroNAS.